Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And I looked at different uh, versions, and I chose uh, the version that was the translation of the voice because I felt like it was, um, it just spoke to me. For this reason, brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, whom I dearly love, I cannot wait to see you again. Continue to stand firm in the Lord and follow my instructions in this letter, beloved. Eudea and Syntyche, I urge you to put aside your differences. Agree and work together in the Lord. Yes, Sisyphus, loyal friend, I enlist you to please help these women. They, along with Brother Clement and many others, have worked by my side to spread the good news of the gospel. They have their names recorded in the book of life. Most of all friends always rejoice in the Lord. I never tire of saying it. Rejoice. Keep your gentle nature so that all people will know what it looks like to walk in his footsteps. The Lord is ever present with us. Don't be anxious about things. Instead, pray. Pray about everything. He longs to hear your requests. So talk to God about your needs and be thankful for what has come. And know that the peace of God, a peace that is beyond any and all of our human understanding, will stand watch over your hearts and minds in Jesus, the Anointed One. Finally, brothers and sisters, fill your minds with beauty and truth. Meditate on whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lo lovely, whatever is good, whatever is virtuous, and praiseworthy. Keep to the script. Whatever you learned and received and heard and saw in me, do it, and the God of peace will walk with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
thank you for your patience. For those of you that haven't heard, um, we as a family had a COVID, COVID exposure last weekend. Um, and then subsequently my daughter tested positive this week. My quarantine is over today, um, but the CDC requires masks and distancing for the next five days. We thought we would uh, reintroduce you to our children and get rid of this plastic next week. So bear with us. Um, will you pray with me? Holy God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my, I'm not sure if I've shared it before, but my grandparents have kind of a love story that's legendary in my family. My grandfather was serving in the army in World War II, but because he couldn't serve abroad because of a physical disability, he was selling war bonds by the way of traveling salesmen. The rumor, the story, is that he ran out of gas rations in a little town in Iowa and walked into the soda fountain where there was a beautiful woman sitting behind the counter. He asked her out, get this, to a sunrise picnic. And, she, and it was April, by the way. A sunrise picnic, and she said yes. And he knew that she must be something special. Now, it gets a little hazy whether they got married after two weeks or be proposed after two weeks. Whether it's two weeks and then two weeks or, or just two weeks. He got the gas rations, they tied the knot, they got into the car. And they drove off into the sunset. They had 70 and a half years of marriage. I remember about mid-60s, I was uh, with them in a hospital room. My grandmother had taken ill, and I lived in Pittsburgh, and the rest of the family lived up in Mercer uh, County or further north. And so I had the responsibility of, of shuttling my grandfather to and from the hospital room because he didn't want to be away from her. And so he stayed with me and we drove back and forth for several days. I remember this so distinctly because we were sitting in the hospital room because I spent a lot of time in Montefiore Hospital that, that week. And I remember asking him, what the key to a long and happy marriage? Now mind you, just to paint the picture, my grandmother is sitting very firm and proper in her chair beside her ICU bed, digging underneath her hospital gown because we must remain modest and white heads and white socks ready to roll because she wants to get out of here. I asked my grandfather, who is sitting by her side on the hospital bed holding her hand, what is the key to long marriage? And he said with some resignation, mutual forbearance. We don't know if it's church-related or 
or has been brought into the church but happened outside the church. We don't know if they're leading factions within the church or if it's a singular issue between the two of them. But we know that Paul believes that the church can help them in their reconciliation. He believes that somehow mutual forbearance is possible and that the body of Christ at Philippi can help with that process. That we together are stronger and can build up the body of Christ. We can build up these two who are in conflict better than they can in, on their own. Paul is calling the church to be the best that it's supposed to be. To be about the work of reconciliation. Reconciliation is the, the restoring back to the way things ought to be. And so he tells them, in front of the whole church, they are called to be united in Christ. And then he quickly moves into this treatise on how to behave. And I would like to think um, that this is just a continuation of his talk to these two women, Sally and Eleanor. I think um, that we have, we have in our Bible, um, hey, mine says like conflict in, in Philippi, and then two verses later, right before we get to the rejoice of the Lord always, it's like the, another heading that has nothing to do with these women. But what happens if Paul is is trying to expand on how this conflict can be resolved. And he starts to talk about these beautiful things. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evidence to all. The Lord is near. Sorry, Shane, I don't have your version memorized. <laughs> now rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be evidence to all. And be thankful. He's talking about all of these beautiful and good things. I think back to a story I heard about um, from Fred Craddock. Craddock supposedly one time, a uh, renowned American pastor, was asked what he hoped for his children. And supposedly in this interview, Craddock said, I hope for my children to be thankful. Because you can't be grumpy if you're thankful. You can't be stingy if you're thankful. You can't be angry and hold a grudge if you're thankful. I think rejoicing is a holy thankfulness. Thankfulness can be something that we all experience. It's kind of a horizontal version of thankfulness, what we have around us. Rejoicing, I believe, is a holy thankfulness. Uh, a direction of gratitude and thankfulness towards God, first and foremost. This is not a hashtag blessed. I'm going to put my best foot forward and make everyone think my life is perfect. It's not a, it's not a, a small or superficial thankfulness. Paul is calling us to a deep well of rejoicing. Because if we remember, if we remember, this letter is written by Paul in jail. He is awaiting most likely his execution. And he probably by this point knows that. And he's not writing to the perfect church. We know that the, the Philippian church has its own problems. We just heard about them two or three verses ago. But somehow he's calling them and us into a deep well of not hashtag blessed, I'm going to tell you all the good things in my life and ignore the bad, but a deep well of awareness of God's grace in their lives and in ours. Interestingly, at this point in this letter, as he's talking about these women and how the church can come alongside them, he has this language of military guard watching over us. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, is one translation. He's using Roman military language to describe what God is going to do for those believers in Philippi. Peace that passes all earthly understanding. Somehow Paul believes that we are not to be anxious. 
for ourselves. He says earlier, I've said it before, he says earlier that um, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He has no anxiety about any of that. But somehow, the lack of anxiety that he's calling us to, having asking God to be our guard of peace, he is not saying that we should be complacent or ignorant of others' concerns. Somehow he's calling us to attention where we are to trust ourselves to God while having worries and concerns for others. He has concerns for these women. He has concerns for the church. He knows that this church had concerns for us earlier in the book. Being worried and caring for others is something it seems that Paul is lifting up while still telling us to cast our anxieties on God, to trust God to be our guard of peace. He then moves out into the world. The list of, of attributes, whatever is lovely, whatever is honorable, whatever is true, that list is actually a list of Greek philosophers' list of things that are wonderful, things that are to be lifted up. Paul is somehow saying to this church that is called to be about the reconciliation of these two women, that they also have a, a role of reconciliation in the world. He's lifting up Greek attributes as something that is godly. So often, we in the church try to hold tight to what we think and where we think God might be working. We see it in the Old Testament. There's a story where Moses calls leaders into a tent to have a meeting with God and have some of God's spirit fall on them. But there are two that decide not to go to the tent. And so they're over with the people and they start prophesying and doing all sorts of crazy stuff in the name of God. And there are people who say, that's not the way it's supposed to happen. They're not with us, so we should stop them. And Moses says, I wish everybody had the Spirit of God. We hear in Jesus' time, a, a man or men casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And the disciples say, they're not one of us. What are you doing? And Jesus says that they're not against us, they're for us. Paul is calling this church not only in Philippi and here, not only to be about the reconciliation of these women, but to be looking at what God might be doing in the world. These things that are not um, isolated to just Christians. Whatever is lovely, whatever is true, whatever is honorable. Where might God be working in the people who are not yet here? God is saying it, getting through Paul. Paul is telling us about the reconciliation of the world and the fact that we, the church, have a role to play. And so where do we find ourselves this, this day? We find ourselves with three challenges. One, what anxiety might we be called to give up, to ask God to remove, to pray that prayer of Paul that the peace of Christ would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus? How might we live into that call, pray that prayer, relinquish those anxieties? Because we all have them. There's an endemic, I've heard it's an endemic and not a pandemic, even though it feels really pandemic y to me right now. We have a divided nation about to face an election. We have a war in Ukraine. We have things to be anxious about. So, how do we give those anxieties? to God without becoming indifferent to the world? How do we trust God for our daily life and breath? That's one. How do we let our God guard, ask God to guard? Two, how do we, how do we see God in our midst? Where might God be calling us to see good and honorable things that maybe are outside the church? How might God be calling us to see what God is up to already and partner in that? And finally, who, who might you or I need to have a little bit extra forbearance with these days? Because 
believes that we, the church, are about the reconciliation of the world. And that starts in our homes, and that starts in our relationships, and that starts in our churches, and spreads out to the world. It might be someone that you spend a lot of time with and you love dearly and you need to have a little extra forbearance. It might be someone that is the person that pushes your buttons more than anyone else, and that might be one and the same person. I don't know. How are we called to hand our anxieties over to God? Ask God to guard our hearts. How are we called this day, this life that we follow Jesus, to see what God might be doing in the world and ask to be a part of it? And who, my dear sisters and brothers, are we called to have an extra measure of grace for? Because the key not just to having marriage, but the key to a life in Christ is mutual forbearance. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we pray that you would help us to give our anxieties up. Sometimes, Lord, we hold too tightly to them. We can't control the world. We can't control our own world. And so we try to hold tight to the things that worry us and keep us up at night. Lord God, help us to relinquish. Help us, those of us who might need extra help, a counselor or medicine, help us to seek that out. Help us to trust you, Lord God. Lord, help us to see what you might be doing in the world, the, the lovely and the beautiful and the truthful and the honorable things that are being done by people who do not yet know you. Help us to see where you are moving hearts and minds already. And help us to have the courage to step into that and be a part of that. And Lord God, help us to rejoice. Help us to have mutual forbearance one for another that is so remarkable, so transformative, that it spills out of our houses and out of our churches into a world that desperately needs to know about your grace.
My brothers and sisters, as we go out into our lives and into our world for the reconciliation of it for the sake of Jesus, may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you. Wherever he may send you, may he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you this day.